if you were to ask the average Dubliner which modern Irish author has captured the sound of the city, the character of its people, and the tenor of their pub conversations, who do you think they would mention? I think the results would be nearly unanimous. Today I'm going to take you through the real and fictional pubs in the work of Roddy Doyle. Welcome to Public podcast about the culture, history and heritage of pubs at home and abroad. Roddy Doyle is one of those unique characters in Irish life. To some, he's the novelist who captured urban and suburban working class voices in fiction during a time of immense change in the country. He's the fella that wrote that trilogy of movies that people quote all the time, And to others, he's the guy that writes humorous interactions between owl lads and pubs and puts them on Facebook. For the purposes of this episode, I'll tell you now at the outset that you don't necessarily need to have read any of Roddy Doyle's books to get anything out of this episode, or for the next for that matter, considering this is a two-parter. Consider it an introduction to his work, focusing a bit narrowly in one aspect of them, the pubs. I had the idea for this episode a few months back, but I have to confess that beyond the Barrytown trilogy of films and maybe one or two of the books, I was reasonably ignorant of Roddy Doyle's work. When I was 12, in a train station, I begged my mother to buy me his Booker Prize winner, Paddy Clark, Ha Ha Ha. I remember that book's cover very well, not because I read it and enjoyed it there and then, but because I begged my mother to get it for me and then never read it, allowing it to languish on a shelf. So, if you're listening, dearest mother, thanks for buying me the book. I finally read it, I enjoyed it, and I'm sorry for being a whiny son. Like I said earlier, I'm going to split this topic into two episodes, as I think a lot of his more recent work incorporates pubs in a more direct and thorough way than some of his earlier work. This first episode is going to concentrate on his so-called Barrytown trilogy. Randy Doyle himself doesn't necessarily like people referring to it as a trilogy, as they were never really intended to be sequels to each other. And besides, it's more commonly accepted to be a pentalogy now, pentalogy meaning a five-part narrative work. I'm going to cover these five books, but also the three high-profile movies that were adapted from the novels and either written in whole or co-written by Doyle himself. A lot of Irish listeners will have great fondness for these books and films, recalling an older, more impoverished and maybe more simple Dublin. I can't claim to have had an upbringing similar to the Rabbit Family children, but the slang and feeling of Dublin conveyed in these books rings true for many, including myself. These earlier books, for the most part, are extremely humorous works, but also capture the struggle of unemployment, of unexpected pregnancy, and other difficulties besetting working-class Dublin at the time. But mostly, they're humorous. I haven't laughed so much while reading in a long, long time. There's humour to be found in characters' ability to retort in Dublin slang, mercilessly slagging an enemy, friend or family member, and then continuing on with conversation as if they hadn't just cut them to shreds. Or from giving out threats that to external ears would imply an impending battering and permanent dissolution of a relationship. Or simply throwing out the words Mickey and Gee could be enough to have you giggling with memories of its usage in the schoolyard or on your local green. Maybe this is where I should put in a bit of a warning for the language used in this episode. It wouldn't be an episode about Roddy Doyle or pubs featured in Roddy Doyle books without using a bit of bad language. So, without further ado, we'll start our first piece of fiction of the episode. I wanted to cover all of these books in sequence, so I opened Paddy Clark, ha ha ha, and within the first few pages I came across the following words. Kevin's father said that Mr. O'Connell howled because he was drunk. He never called him Mr. O'Connell, he called him the Tinker. Will you look who's talking, said my mother when I told her that. And then she said, don't listen to him, Patrick. He's codding you. Sure, where would he get drunk? There's no pubs in Barrytown. There's no pubs in Barrytown. Page three of my first book. Well, that wasn't a great start to the old pub finding project, but I suppose it was to be expected. This novel is about the life of a young man attending school and his parents' relationship as seen naively and innocently through his own eyes, with the reader intuiting for themselves what's really going on on the adult end of things. In this book, Barrytown isn't fully formed yet. It's a suburb still under construction. Some of the housing estates have been newly built, but the surrounding infrastructure hasn't caught up, and so there's no local pub just yet. It's in a book or two's time where the local pub plays more of a role in the story. 
This is a story well known to Dublin families during the rapid expansion of the city after the war, with newly created suburbs popping up in former farmland sprawling out from the city centre. Some of my childhood memories are of the construction of housing estates on top of what was once field upon field, and places where you would once walk your dog or play as a child, then turning into a shopping centre or an entirely new estate, from farmland to wasteland to suburbia. Moving on to Roddy Doyle's breakout hit as an author that also catapulted him into the international limelight with the screen adaptation of the story. Jimmy Rabbit knew his music. He knew his stuff all right. You'd never see Jimmy coming home from town without a new album or a 12-inch or at least a 7-inch single. Jimmy ate Melody Maker and the NME every week and Hot Press every two weeks. He listened to Dave Fanning and John Peel. He even read his sister's Jackie when no one was looking. So Jimmy knew his stuff. It is, of course, the story of The Commitments, the hardest working class soul band in Dublin. The story centres around a young man with strong opinions on what is good and what is shite music, deciding that he is the winning formula for putting together an authentic and musically exciting band. The formula being a white Irish working class soul band that will blow the socks off any live audience and make Dubliners proud to be where they're from. Jimmy puts an advert in the Hot Press magazine and invites people to come and audition for places in the band. He already has a few pals in mind to form part of the rhythm section of the band, including his pan, including his pal Outspan Foster, who he steals from another band. While meeting Outspan and Derek in an unnamed local pub, presumably the local that we'll go to in more detail in the next book, Outspan explains the name of their current band. Putting the finishing touches to your album, said Jimmy. Putting the finishing touches to our name, said Outspan. What are you now? And, and, exclamation mark, right? And, said Derek. Jimmy grinned a sneer. Fuck, fuck, exclamation mark, me. I bet I know who thought of that. With a few more recruits secured and the bones of the band put together, including Joey the Lips Fagan on trumpet and Deco on vocals, the band began their rehearsals. It's not just the music they discuss, it's also the philosophy of the band. They want to be an anti-drug band, one that says that the working people of Dublin are better off without weed, and especially without heroin. And of course, when you're claiming soul as the music of the people, what drink do you think they consider to be the drink of the people? Jimmy gives out to Billy for having a joint before a practice. Right, where was he? Yeah, we're a soul group. We want to make a few bob, but we have our principles. It's not just about the money. It's politics too, remember? We're supposed to be bringing soul to Dublin. We can't do that and smoke hash at the same time. It's only hash. The tip of the fucking iceberg, Billy. Dublin's fucked up with drugs. Drugs aren't soul. What about drinking? That's different, said Jimmy. That's okay. The working class have always had their few scoops. Guinness is soul food said Joey the Lips. That's me arse, Jimmy, said Outspan. Listen, said Jimmy, for fuck's sake, we can't say we're playing the people's music if we're messing around with drugs. We should be against drugs, anti-drugs, heroin and that. Guinness is soul food. Now that's one for a t-shirt. So Guinness got the thumbs up from the commitments, so I guess that means that the band were also alright with pubs. I suppose it'd have to be, considering that's where they were going to be getting their gigs. Jimmy Rabbit searched for gigs around Dublin, mostly in pubs. Hold on a second, I feel I need to make a distinction going forward. In these books, and in this film, there is Jimmy Rabbit Jr., the young man, and Jimmy Rabbit Sr., his father, who you'll likely know as played by Colin Meany in the film. I'm telling you this now because when it comes to pubs and the next two books, the senior is the main man of the stories. Anyway, back to the commitments and Jimmy Jr., Jimmy is looking around a few places and finally stumbles across the Regency Rooms, which is actually just one room, and there's no money for the band, but they'll all get three free pints each for playing. That was before the booker knew just how many people there were in this very large, multi-instrumental and multi-singer soul group. The pint quota was lowered when they arrived, but brought back up once the booker saw them playing and the crowd's reaction. With the exception of the local pub in Barrytown, which is a fictional suburb based on Kilbarrick where Reddy Doyle lived and worked, most of the pubs that he used in his work were or are real pubs and venues. This is another mark of authenticity both for the story and for Doyle as a man who truly does know his music and would have went to gigs presumably in a lot of these places. He was known after all by the students in the school where he worked as Punk Doyle 
as he was the only teacher to wear Doc Martens and was clearly into his music. In terms of the Regency rooms, there was a music venue of the same name in the Regency airport on the Swords Road, but the gigs in 1990 were more cabaret and Elvis impersonators than soul music, but it may well have been the same space. Following the gig in the Regency Rooms, the band get a good notice in the Northside People newspaper. With this as an aid, Jimmy manages to book a series of gigs in a Southside bar near the Dart Line called the Miami Vice, which was previously known as the Dark Rosaline. I couldn't find any reference to either venue in the archives, but they might have existed. One element of the book that didn't make it to the screen version was the altering of the lyrics of some of the songs they covered to include more Dublin references and to bring it closer to the natives. One example is in James Brown's song Man's World, in which lead singer Deco ad-libs and shakes things up considerably at one of their Miami Vice gigs. You see, Deco was singing to the girls, man drives the buses that bring us round and a bow, and man works in Guinnesses to give us the points of stout. The crowds began to clap here. Deco raised his hands and the clapping stopped. And man, man has all the important jobs, like he collects all the taxes. But woman, woman only works up in Cadbury's, putting chocolates into boxes. So, so, it's a man's, man's world, but it would be nothing, nothing, fuck all, without a woman or a girl. In terms of the novel, that's largely it for the pub and drink references of note, except for one or two involving Jimmy. Here he's talking with sax player Dean about being out for pints. Did you come home with the bus? Dean asked Jimmy. I haven't gone home yet, said Jimmy. I went over for a few scoops with a few of the lads out of work. Brussels, do you know it? Yeah, it's good. Some great looking Judies. Yeah. Brussels always had a good reputation as a music pub, with the downstairs area used for gigs and more generally as a hangout area. The pub still has a rock bar downstairs these days where they have a Phil Linnet themed snug. It's not quite the same vibe as it used to be but many music lovers drank here for years and even met their partners here. If a music snob like Jimmy Rabbit liked it then it must have been a decent spot for tunes. Jimmy also arranges to meet a fella from a music label called Egypt Records in the Bailey but the meeting never takes place. But that's not the end of the pubs related to the commitments. See if you could play before I pay for them. Lads, you're looking at the commitment tests. Brilliant management, Brother Rabbit. Let's keep relations on a professional basis. <laughs> How are we professional if we've never been paid? The adapted movie version of The Commitments was directed by Alan Parker, whose work before The Commitments included Midnight Express, Mississippi Burning, and various musical projects including the hit Bugsy Malone. With Alan Parker's inclusion as director, the budget for the project soared. For a few months, the production employed hundreds of people as extras, stagehands, and musicians. Many people got their break in this film, going on to have successful careers as musicians, and in front of, as well as behind the scenes, of big productions. One brilliant resource for the Barrytown movies is a three-part documentary series aired on RTE in 2021 called Back to Barrytown, in which many of the original cast are interviewed. Ruddy Doyle and Colin Meany sit in Cleary's pub on Amian Street, watching clips and sharing reminiscences of working on the project. Pubs were used extensively in the pre-production phase of the film. As the movie was to feature a whole host of talented musical characters, they first had to find the actors and the talent to play these people. Musicians Wanted posters were placed in every pub in Dublin city centre. Scouts would go on extensive pub crawls around the city's musical pubs, going to multiple gigs in one night looking for people with the right look and character, as well as a sufficient amount of musical talent. Once a long list of musicians had been drafted together, they were all invited to go to marathon audition sessions, which were held at the Waterfront Bar and Venue on the South Quays, up towards the Ferryman pub. The building still exists today, the front at least, but it's no longer used as a bar. 
The waterfront was also used in the movie itself, with the band's final gig of the film being filmed here under the name Gallagher's. A raucous crowd are there to watch their commitments entertain and subsequently implode as they squabble in the wake of Wilson Pickett not showing up to jam with them. The most prominently featured pub in the film, featuring in two scenes, by my reckoning at least, is Cleary's Pub on Amiens Street. It still stands today and looks much the same, in fact. As I said earlier, it was chosen for the conversation between Doyle and Meany for the RT retrospective, and I'd suspect it's the type of place that Roddy Doyle might enjoy a pint, given that it's the sort of place where you'd go for a chat or to read the paper, and there's no music. Though it is also the type of place where they put on the 6 wood news, and I've heard from someone that they used to have a weekly tradition of watching the midweek James Bond movie when it was an RTE, but that was a few years back. Anyway, back to the film. The genesis of the band begins over a pint in Cleary's between Jimmy Jr., played by Robert Arkins, Outspan Foster, played by Glenn Hansard, and Dick Massey as Billy Mooney. I also think the pub is used in a short scene where Jimmy Rabbit Sr. is in having a pint when his twin daughters come in to tell him that the commitments gig across the road in the community centre is actually good. A few pubs are seen only in passing in outdoor scenes including Tom Mulligan's, still owned and operated now under the more familiar name of the Cobblestone, as well as Delaney's down the road and the now gone Bo Darrell's, and the Temple Bar pub as well. The rehearsal space used in several scenes of the film was once a pool hall but in more recent times became the Palace Nightclub and is now a huge sports bar called the Camden. Where once Joey the Lips blew his trumpet and Dean wailed on his sax, there now stands a mini brewery operated by the Five Lamps brand. In a fitting tribute to the main character of the film, a sister bar to the Camden, located next door, is now named Jimmy Rabbits, highlighting the ongoing connection between the building and the film. The impact of the film was huge for Dublin, representing its urban life and people in a way that had never been captured on screen. It's still a hugely quotable film too. When Jimmy Sr. asked Jimmy Jr. where Joey the Lips came from, Jimmy Jr. replies that he was sent by God, to which Jimmy Sr. exclaims, On a feckin' Suzuki, quotable as it was, it probably can't rival our next entry in the Barrytown trilogy for memorable lines. If The Commitments was a book and film about Dublin as a whole, The Snapper covers a much smaller area of the country and focuses more directly in on Barrytown. This is a more intimate portrayal of a Dublin suburb and the Rabbit family. Jimmy Jr. does feature, but in a much less prominent way. This book deals largely with the relationship between Jimmy Sr. and his daughter Sharon, who begins our story by telling her parents that she's become pregnant at the age of 20 and she won't tell them who the father is. After a tense exchange between Sharon and her parents, all is largely resolved and the shock of the moment has passed. Jimmy's rage and confusion has lessened and his parental instinct takes over. And what better way to show that you're not angry than offering to take your pregnant daughter to the local pub? It was a different time, of course. Jimmy Sr. had a nice idea. Are you coming for a drink, Sharon? No thanks, Daddy. I'll stay in tonight. I go on. All right. Sharon smiled. Good girl, you may as well. Jimmy Sr. came back with the drinks and sat in beside Sharon. He hated the tables up here, in the lounge. You couldn't get your legs in under them. Sharon couldn't either. She sat side saddle. Thanks a lot, Daddy, said Sharon when she'd poured the coke in with the vodka. Ah, no problem, said Jimmy Sr. He'd never had a drink with Sharon before. He watched his pint settling, something he never did when he was downstairs in the bar. He only came up here on Sundays. And now... This is our first visit to a pub that becomes known to us later in the book as the Hiker's Rest, the local pub in Barrytown that becomes the prime drinking location for the parents and their children of drinking age. The bar downstairs was the domain of Jimmy and his mates while the upstairs lounge catered for a younger audience and was a more musical and raucous affair. The Hiker's Pub would sponsor the Barrytown Wheelies, a breakaway bicycle club formed later in the book by Jimmy. The Hiker's Rest Pub, Pub Grub, was printed on the back of the cycling tops, though there's little evidence of food being served in the pub across any of the books, save for the occasional packet of crisps unfolded on a table. It's to the pub that Jimmy and Sharon go to talk more intimately, a place that they can both feel comfortable to talk more frankly about matters. It's home turf for both of them, and no doubt a jar or two might loosen the tongue. The Hikers fulfills an important function in the Barrytown books as a place of celebration, of reflection, and sometimes as a retreat from arguments or more difficult elements of family life. 
At another later point in the book, Sharon once again goes to the hikers, this time to meet up with a few pals who are desperate for a bit of detail about her pregnancy and who might be the father. Sharon concocts a story about meeting a Spanish sailor and having a one-night affair. They met, apparently, in the Harp Bar, which is now the River Bar, on the south end of O'Connell Bridge. Readers of the book will know that this is a concoction and that the real father of the child is the older neighbour and her friend's father, George, Georgie Borges. Burgess sends Sharon a letter on pink paper with bunny rabbits in the corner, pleading for forgiveness and something more. Dear Sharon, I hope you are well. Please meet me in the Abbey Mooney in town at 8 o'clock on Tuesday night. I want to talk to you about something very important. I am looking forward to seeing you. Yours sincerely, George Burgess. P.S. The paper is my sister's. We know that the lounge and bar had different styles to fit the age profile of the separate clientele, and we also know that modern technology had made its way to Barrytown pubs from this passage that we found funny for some reason. He decided to wash his hands. They'd installed a new hand dryer and he wanted to have a go on it. That's it. That's the passage. As a signifier of how important the local was in the life of these characters, the pub is used as a prop or bargaining chip in the course of an argument and standoff between Jimmy and Sharon. Jimmy Sr. began to time his moods. This gave him the best of both worlds. He could enjoy his depression when Sharon was around, or when he thought she was around, and he could enjoy his few pints with the lads as well. Sharon didn't go up to the hikers anymore. She went to Hoth or Rohini or into town, so he let her believe that he didn't go there either. He didn't announce it or anything, he just hinted at it. He wondered out loud where he'd go tonight, or he waited till she went out before he went out, or he stayed in. He wanted her to think she'd robbed his local of him. Jimmy is supposedly the adult and the father in this situation, yet he's using the idea of the pub as his safe space in an attempt to hurt Sharon. When the situation is resolved, Jimmy thinks to himself that his treat will be to bring his heavily pregnant daughter for a few drinks in the hikers. Speaking of drinking while pregnant, the topic is addressed by Sharon and her pals in a pub in Hoth, very close to the birth date. I shouldn't be doing this. What? Drinking? Ah, don't be thick, Sharon. You need to get pissed now and again. There's no harm in it. Yeah, said Sharon. The old Irish philosophy of, ah, sure, it'll be grand, hard at work. The Snapper. Sharon Curley is young. Single and about to be blessed with a snapper. I'm pregnant. She's bleeding serious. Who was it? Who did the damage? Who are you having it for? I can't tell. Why not? We must know him. Is he married? Is he in here? What do you think? I don't know. It's the best you can do. Her father's thrilled. You went to a hotel room and you're telling me you can't remember his name? I was drunk, he said. I was drunk when I met your mother. I still remember her name. But Sharon's got a secret. I don't mind being pregnant. The film adaptation of the book was made by English director Stephen Frears, who set about making a more intimate movie. A family portrait that initially began life as a TV movie for the BBC and was received so well at film festivals that a cinema release was demanded. Colomini reprised his role as Jimmy Rabbit, though the Rabbit family had to change their surname to Curly because 20th Century Fox owned the rights to the characters used in the commitments. So Sharon Rabbit became Sharon Curly and she was played by Tina Gallagher. The film was a roaring success at home and abroad, becoming maybe the most quoted Irish movie of all time. Hey Borges, snip snip, I suppose a ride's out of the question, and so on. Two pubs were used for the scene set in the Hikers pub, though it wasn't called the Hikers. The upstairs of the pub was filmed in the water mill in Rohini, where Sharon and her pals drank. The downstairs and exterior was the Cedar Lounge in Dunamead. Not only is the pub still there today, but so too is the table where Jimmy and his pals sat and drank. The round table was built for the film, made initially from plywood, and then rebuilt when the pub was refurbished in recent years. The Foxhound, which was located nearby where the bulk of the filming was done, wasn't used directly on camera, but the pub's car park was where the actors' trailers were located during filming. The pub would go on to be used in our next film. At the climax of this film, Sharon is driven across Dublin in a frenzy by her dad on the way to the Rotunda Hospital. After Sharon has given birth and it's clear that the baby is safe and healthy, Jimmy does as so many Irish men did in those days and the days before. He goes across the road to Conway's pub on Parnell Street to have a pint and wet the baby's head. Sadly, the pub is in a derelict condition today. If you were listening two episodes ago, you might remember it for the claim that it was the oldest pub in the North City. 
Jimmy calls his wife Kay to give her the good news and then orders a pint of Guinness. He sits and studies the pint, admiring it. In the book, he gulps it down in one in celebration. In the film, he turns to an older man at the bar and says, Seven pounds, twelve ounces. To which the old man replies, Is that a turkey or a baby? It's a baby. That's a good sized baby. Small turkey though. The third book in the Barrytown trilogy is, I have to say, my favourite of his books. Maybe because this one centres around a male friendship. Jimmy and Bimbo are both unemployed. Jimmy is more used to it, whereas Bimbo has only recently been let go. The two are neighbours, drinking buddies and pitch and putt pals. Then they take the plunge to go into business together. Well, Bimbo buys a chipper van, one that's more battered than the sausages they sell, and hires Jimmy to work with him. The ensuing success of the business inspires jealousy and acrimony between the two as their friendship breaks down over the ownership of the business and to whom the success belongs. The Hiker's Pub features even more prominently in the van compared to the Snapper, and it's here that Bimbo tells the lads of his redundancy and the genesis of the new business idea takes hold. There's some nice insights into the philosophy of local pub drinkers and why they visit. It's not necessarily for the alcohol, as this reflection from Jimmy Senior from the book shows. It wasn't the pint Jimmy Senior loved. That wasn't it. He liked his pint. He fucking loved his pint. But that wasn't why he was here. He could do without it. He was doing without it. He only came up about two times a week these days since he'd been laid off and he never missed the drink. Not really. Every night at about nine o'clock when he heard the news music, he started getting itchy and he had to concentrate on staying, sitting there and watching the news and being interested in it. But it wasn't the gargle he was dying for. It was this. He sat back and smiled at Bimbo. The lads here, the crack, the laughing, this was what he loved. While Jimmy was reflective on what made the pub experience so enjoyable, he was also very protective of it. His back was up when some people who he regarded as not fitting in came into the pub for a drink. He and his group of pals debated the issue in their own inimitable way. You can't stop people from coming in if they want, said Bimbo. It's a pub. Course you can, said Jimmy Sr., He's right, compadre, Bertie told Bimbo. How is he? said Bimbo. A pub is a pub, a public house. Leo arrived with Jimmy Senior's pint. Now, said Leo. Good man, Leo, said Jimmy Senior. At this point, there's a break in the semi-heated discussion to stop and admire the pints that have just been laid before them. A reverence descends around the group. Fuck me, it looks lovely, they agreed. It did. The head of the pint stood higher than the glass, curving up and then flat and solid looking. The outside of the glass was clean. The whole thing looked like an ad. Jimmy Senior tilted the glass a little bit, but the head stayed the way it was. They admired it. My Jesus, said Jimmy Senior. What? They got down off their stools and headed for an empty table. Anyway, said Bimbo, anyone should be able to come into a pub if they want. No way, said Jimmy Senior. I'm inclined to agree with Bimbo on this one. While the lads are enjoying their drinks in the pub, one of them asks if they want chasers of John Wainers. A few sentences later and John Wainers are revealed to be a measure of Jemison. Now that's a new one on me and I can't seem to figure out the reference. If anyone more streetwise than me would care to educate me, I'm all ears. A few weeks pass and after much graft, cleaning and potato peeling, Jimmy and Bimbo set up their van outside the local pub. The timing for them and for Roddy Doyle is perfect. The lads are selling to punters who have just witnessed Ireland in the World Cup, drawing against England, Egypt and the Netherlands and beating Romania to reach the quarterfinals of the 1990 World Cup. This proves to make for a hugely successful business at the outset, with drinkers piling out of the pub in roaring and hungry for. For Roddy Doyle, it was the perfect social event that everyone experienced to construct your narrative around. After a busy few summer months, Jimmy and Bimbo agree to go for a night out on the town, starting in the hikers and making their way towards the city. Tensions between the two have already come to the surface and adding alcohol into the mix proves to be a match to the powder keg. But first, the lads have a bit of a pub crawl to do. They start in a pub that Jimmy declares and Bimbo agrees to have the best pint in Dublin. Where could it be? Drum roll please. 
Mulligans of Poolbeg Street. This is the opinion of Jimmy Senior, but could it also be the opinion of Roddy Doyle? The two lads had three pints in Mulligans before moving on for a pub crawl around the area. They put their jackets on, went for a slash, the first one's always the best, and headed off for somewhere new. Where, said Bimbo, Doyle's, Bow's, the palace, two pints in each of them. They were new places to Bimbo, and to Jimmy Senior, although he'd walked past them and had a look in. He'd promised himself that he ever had any money again, he'd inspect them properly. And here he was. Good, consistent pints, he said. So far, anyway, very good, yeah. They were in the palace, standing up against the wall near the doors because there was no room further in. The women were a disappointment, not what he'd imagined. They were hippie-ish, scrawny women, who'd expected a bit of glitter. Not in mulligans, they'd gone in there strictly for the pints, but in the other ones. That was why they were in the palace now, in town, in their suits. Jimmy Senior wanted something to happen. Maybe they should have gone to hope. Still though, it was good to be just out, with Bimbo, away from everything. Not a bad pub crawl at all. That sequence of pubs will have to be renamed the Van Crawl or the Rabbit Crawl or something like that. Answers on a postcard to publinie at gmail.com. Jimmy's earlier philosophising about why he goes to the pub and what he enjoys about it would lead me to believe that he'd enjoy Bose very much. On the wall in Bose, above the bar, there's an inscription that reads... Bo's Bar is dedicated to those merry souls who make drinking a pleasure, who reach contentment before capacity, and whatsoever they drink can hold it and remain gentlemen. Now, having said that, the lads were fairly well on at this stage and went looking for a late night pint as their money began to dwindle away. They were better off than what they had been, but they were far from rich. They made their way to a downstairs bar on Leeson Street where they pondered what to drink in such an establishment. A pint? said Jimmy Senior. Not here, said Bimbo. Jimmy Senior agreed with him. A pint of stout in this place would leave them pebble dashing the jacks for the rest of the weekend. It's here that Jimmy and Bimbo have their disagreement and blow out, ultimately resulting in the dissolution of the business that they'd built up from nothing. Well, the final nail was the visit from the health inspector. Just as in the snapper, there's a falling out between Jimmy and someone close to him. But again, there is reconciliation. And where do they do it? Over a pint in the hikers, of course. It's not exactly a full layerings of feelings, thoughts and emotions. These are, after all, two Irish men in the early 90s, but it's as close as these two are able to get. They sit, drinking, staring at each other and into the distance. Four or five pints later, Jimmy Senior had lost count. Bimbo was looking demolished. Jimmy Senior was holding his own, he thought. Knackered, yeah, but not rat arsed. Now, writer Roddy Doyle and director Stephen Frears bring you the third installment of the Berrytown Trilogy. I love Ireland! A comedy about two old friends. Good man, lovely. Jay! Who join forces. What colors are supposed to be, anyway? Boy, how did it get crazy on the outside? To start a new career. How did he make this? Oh, Jay! But find the road to riches. Let's get a bit of light in here. Can be a little bumpy. It's your problem. It's your problem. It's not fish. What is it? It's white. Jeez. It's a nappy. Is it a used one? No. Ah, well, that's all right then, huh? Fox Searchlight Pictures presents. This is the business. Stephen Frears returned once more with a slightly altered cast, and the Rabbit family also returned once more, but without a surname and with their first names changed. Jimmy was now Larry. The pub used for the exterior and interior shots was the Foxhound Inn in Kilbarrick. It's an iconic location now from the humour scenes of the chip van outside its doors and the sights of extras in Irish jerseys going wild replicating the scenes of Irish jubilation during Italia 90. The pub is still standing but no longer in operation. Maybe it's just looking for the right owner to come along. It's hard to tell which pub Colomini and Donald O'Kelly are in on their city centre pub crawl, but they make for a basement wine bar on Leeson Street called Leo's that looks like its signage may have been created just for this scene in the movie. I can't find any mention of a Leo's bar having actually been there. We're on our way now to our final visit to Barrytown and to reconnect with Jimmy Rabbit Jr. as an older and slightly wiser man. 26 years after The Commitments was first published and 22 years after the release of the film, Roddy Doyle wrote The Guts, a story about Jimmy in adulthood, living with his wife, his four kids and bowel cancer. Jimmy's diagnosis and medical treatment coincide with him meeting up once more with pals from the old days, like Outspan Foster and Imelda Quirk. He's working in what you might consider a dream job for him. 
running a business that relaunches music made by old bands from the 80s and organises reunion gigs for them in venues like Whelan's on Wexford Street. To quote the book, Jimmy and Aoife reared their kids and managed dead bands across the kitchen table and once every month or so they left the kids with the newest babysitter and went to one of their own reunion gigs in Whelan's or somewhere else that made sense to people their age. And there was always something, good or bad, but always good, to bring home later. It's not only Jimmy Jr. that we get to catch up with, but also Jimmy Sr. and interestingly for us, the Hikers Pub as well. The story begins with Jimmy and Jimmy meeting over a few quiet pints, as we're told they occasionally do. We get some insight into the changing face of the pub, including the possible changing ethnicity of the barmen, as Jimmy Jr. pondered to himself. He looked foreign, Polish or Latvian or that part of the world, but he wasn't foreign. Could you give us a glass of water, please? The barman sighed and turned away. That proved it, Jimmy decided. The cunt was a dub. As in other times of trouble when things needed to be talked out, the Rabbit family returned to their local, the Hikers, as a place where they could feel comfortable enough, after a jar or two, to unload or digest some news. Jimmy Jr. found it a great relief to break his health problems to his father and felt a weight lift off him, as though the whole thing was eminently more manageable and treatable now. The relief was such that he pondered about not going home at all, continuing drinking and taking his chances by leaving the car in the car park overnight. The goo comes in many forms and can strike at any time. He observes his dad with the renewed reverence as he moves around the bar, chatting to people, ordering a drink, and he poetically describes the moment his father sits down and about how the arse and the glass landed at the exact same time. We often wonder what characters in a good book get up to later in life, and in this book we get an answer, a satisfying and entertaining answer to that question. What about Bimbo and the lads and the feeling that Jimmy Sr. had with them when going to the pub? I can't have a few pints anymore without having to get up to go to the Jacks three or four times a night. So I have my pints earlier and I call it a day. Earlier, if that makes sense. And fuck it, I'm happy enough. What about the lads? The lads, said Jimmy Sr. The lads are kind of a distant memory. But that's a different story. Sad in its own way, but an understandable part of ageing and how it changes you, your relationship with your pals and how you socialise. Not all of it is roses and laughter over pints, but it's not always misery either, as you'll see if you read this book and see how much humour can be found in the situation of a man with bowel cancer. Each of these books has characters that you can admire for their kindness and wit, but also judge for their shortcomings. But ultimately you, as a reader, come away with an understanding of their motivations and what compels their behaviour. They're usually fundamentally flawed, but decent, just like all of us. The pub serves its function in the lives of these characters to allow a space for them to open up, to have fun, to air grievances and to escape to. So that's the Barrytown trilogy, or Pentalogy, and the stories relating to its pubs. Some fictional, some factual but always real. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Publin Podcast. If you enjoyed that episode and the work of Roddy Doyle, then don't fret, as this is a two-part episode. In the second section, I'll be going into other pub-heavy works by Roddy Doyle, such as Smile, Two Pints, and Love, which is essentially one big pub crawl in a book. It's one of those books that leaves you gasping for a pint as you go through it. But more on that next week. I want to give a a shout out to a listener to the podcast. I accidentally came across a post on Facebook by a man named Michael Evans from Georgia in the USA, who has been a listener to the podcast since it started last year. He made a pilgrimage to David and Billy Carr, the brothers in the clock in Mulligan's pub, which he heard about in episode one. Michael contacted Mike Carr, the brother's sibling, who I interviewed from that episode, and asked for permission to visit the brothers, and that he did. He put a pint on the ledge beside the clock for the two men and I just want to say thanks to Michael for listening, for being such a gent, for giving Mike Carr a call. If you have any questions, comments or the like, you can send me, John, an email via publinie at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening and as always, sláinte.